What is going on, investors? It's Q&A Sunday here on the Investor a Channel, where we answer your investing questions. If you have a question that you'd like to hear on the Investor Channel Q&A segment, leave me a question down below. I'll be sure to get to it next week. Now, I've also included in the description down below timestamps for you to identify. Maybe you want to jump around and find questions that are pertinent to you. I will include the timestamps where all the questions start on the channel so that might be easier for you to find them thanks for the listener that suggested that let's jump right into the question number one hi i would like to ask the following question on strategy currently i hold some stocks long with a horizon of about four to five years with no intention of selling at any price but i also have some on a shorter time frame where i have a price target in mind what's a good strategy on these stocks sell everything at the reach target price or sell a portion of the stock i.e the value is resident 10 percent do I sell the 10% value or close the position and maybe miss on additional growth? So an interesting question here. I think what you probably want, and maybe this will help you, is probably working with trailing stops and trailing stop losses. So what a trailing stop is, a little bit different than a stop loss. On a normal stop loss, let's take the example here. I've got Tesla up here and it's at $430 per share at the current moment. Let's just say I bought it down here at at a, you know, $360 and I say, I don't want to lose any money on this trade. So I'm going to put a stop loss. No, we'll just call it an even 400 bucks. Once Tesla or if Tesla comes down to $400, then my stop loss will be executed for the most part. Okay. Tesla could have some overnight action and it could blow through your stop loss and you get closed down lower than that. So you still could potentially lose money. But for the sake of this video, we'll just say I set a stop loss at 400 and so if Tesla pulls back to $400, well, I'll be closed out of my stock. Now, trailing stops work a little bit differently. What you can do and what I often do is put them in, in per, there's trailing stops with a dollar amount and then there's also trailing stops with a percentage. I tend to like percentages maybe a little bit better. So what happens is you set your trailing stop by percentage. Let's say Tesla today is at $430 per share and I put underneath it a 10% trailing stop. That means if Tesla drops from 430 down 10%, which at the top of my head is probably about $43 then your stop loss would be executed down at the 10% below where the stop is. Now, what's interesting about a trailing stop is let's assume that Tesla just keeps rallying. It doesn't go down. It comes all the way up here to $500. Well, guess what? Your trailing stop loss will be bumped up automatically. And so now once Tesla stock kind of uh, peaks up here and starts to pull back, well, your 10% stop loss, instead of being $43 below, now will be $50 below. So this stock would have to go from 500 down back to 450 for your stop loss to be executed. You can do the same thing in a dollar amount too, a trailing stop in a dollar amount. You could do $5, you could do $10, whatever it is. Once the stock kind of peaks out and then starts to pull back, your stop loss will be in effect. But it will, keep in mind, it will keep moving up with the stop price as long as your stop isn't executed. So for example, if I have a $10 st st trailing stop underneath Tesla stock, that would be at $419 at today's price. But if Tesla never gets down to 419, let's say it gets to Elon Musk's favorite number 420 and stops there, but then rallies all the way up to 500. Well, your stop loss would be in place, except now it would be $10 under 500, which would be about $490 per share. So I hope I explained that a little bit for you. Now, I think part of your question too is, do you sell all or portion of the stock? I'll leave that up to you. If you have 100 shares and you want to lock in some gains on maybe 10 percent of that stock or, or, or 50 shares or whatever it is. I don't have any problem with that at all. And you can certainly put like a trailing stop underneath only a portion of those shares. I certainly don't think that's a bad idea at all. Hopefully I helped answer your question.
Moving on to our next question. This one says, could you talk about the ETFs in general, please? And so certainly. So ETFs, for those of you who might be brand new to investing, ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. And what that is, is a fund that is traded just like a stock on the stock market. And it differs from a mutual funds. ETFs, in my opinion, kind of spawned from mutual funds, which 20 years ago, when I first started investing, were the most popular investment. But ETFs have taken over in terms of popularity and in my opinion much better choice versus mutual funds so what an etf is and i think it's best explained by just taking a look at one so here i am on etf.com not affiliated with this website and there might be other ones that are out there that are better than this but i this is just the one that i come to because it's it's laid out pretty nice so we're going to take a look at qqq one of the most well-known ETFs in the market. It mirrors the NASDAQ 100. And in fact, in fact, it tells you here on the fund description, this one tracks a modified market cap weight of the 100 NASDAQ listed stocks. So what I would do is whenever I want to invest in an ETF or I want to figure out what an ETF is, comes about, I come down to QQQ top 10 holdings. And so you want to come down here to the top holdings of an ETF because that's what an ETF is. It's, it's a basket of stocks. And this one happens to to hold Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and then on down the line. You take a look here, the top three stocks count for way about a third actually of the market cap of the stock. And so Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon is about 33% of the holdings. So here's some things that you want to think about with an ETF. Let's just say I already own Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon. Well, QQQ might not be the best option for me as an ETF, in my opinion, because now it's overexposing me to those stocks even more. Unless I want that exposure for whatever reason with QQQ, I will now be even more exposed to these top stocks. If you have no exposure to any of these tech stocks and you don't want to have to pick Apple over Microsoft or pick Tesla over Google, and you want exposure to all these stocks without having to individually go and buy them, well, an ETF like this would be perfect for you. Now, I'll tell you how I use ETFs. In my opinion, if you want above average returns, I think you need to be out there actively managing and stock picking a portfolio. If you want average returns, a blended average of 100 NASDAQ listed stocks, well, QQQ is going to give that to you, but you're at the mercy of that particular index. Here's where ETFs, in my opinion, have great value is when you are not familiar with a certain sector. So for me personally, if you look on my channel, I almost rarely post videos in the healthcare segment. It's because it's a segment that I just personally don't know much about, okay? And so the way I get exposure to the healthcare, instead of going and picking the Pfizer's and the Merck's and the companies out there that might exist in that space, what I do is I find a healthcare ETF. I come take a look at the expense ratio. I come take a look at, here's the expense ratio of QQQ. It's at 0.2. Anything in this range, I think, is a reasonable expense ratio. Anything over, I would say, 0.5 to 0.8 and certainly 1%, I think, is a very, very hefty expense ratio. I would look for a different fund out there. I would also look for one that is very liquid, that has a plenty of volume and is trading very actively on the stock market because, look, ETFs can be closed down. They can be shut down, and it's something that you want to be aware of. The other thing is, is you get exposure to a basket of stocks. So in my situation where I am not a healthcare expert, I get access to healthcare stocks via ETFs. And that's how personally I would use ETFs. If you want to be a trader, if you want to trade the NASDAQ, if you want to trade the S&P 500 and that type of thing, then ETFs are also a great resource for you as well. Again, just make sure they are heavily traded. The other use I use ETFs for is gold and silver. If I want exposure to the metal, just not in the physical form, ETFs are a great way to get exposure to gold and silver via the stock market as well. So in general, I really like ETFs. If you want to build your entire portfolio, your entire investment thesis around ETFs, 
I am not here to discourage you from doing that. What I would say is you're likely going to get average returns. If you want above average returns, in my opinion, you need to mix ETFs in with individual stocks, but I would focus on individual stocks where you particularly know that market and know the companies that are going to be winners inside that market. So for me, it's technology, it's consumer facing goods companies, and the sectors of the market that I don't know as well, maybe like oil and gas and healthcare companies, I get exposure to that via ETFs and I'm able to achieve some market results via that form. So hopefully that helped with ETFs. Next question is coming in from Spikey says, can you look at MGM stock, please love your videos. Appreciate that. So yeah, let's jump right into it. Let's take a look at MGM. I personally, just anecdotally, I think they've got the best properties on the Las Vegas strip with the Aria, the Vidara is nice. They've got the MGM grand is pretty nice. They've revamped that area around New York, New York, so everything looks pretty good from a property standpoint. Now, I know they've got some uh, properties in Macau, which I, don't, I haven't had the privilege of visiting, but let's take a look at the financials here. We've got three months ended here, 19 over 20. We also have the nine months, 19 over 20. So obviously this company, like all the casino operators in Las Vegas, were shut down and things are still not even close to being back to normal. We see revenues here total went from $3.3 billion down to $1.1 billion. That is like, a, what, a two-thirds drop across the board here. Let's see how they are holding up on these costs, okay? All the costs are outlined here. So we spent three sixty eight dollars to make six ninety dollars on the casino. So they're making money on the casino floor. They spent one hundred seven dollars to make one hundred one seventy five dollars on rooms. They're making money there. Food and beverage, they spent one thirty three dollars to make one twenty six. dollars That's probably more of a loss leader thing for them anyways. You see in the previous period, they spent four twenty seven dollars to make 560. So they used to make money on food and beverage. It's pulled back a little bit. We've got entertainment was at 88 to make 101. So they're still solid there on retail and entertainment. And finally, reimbursement costs is just uh, balanced out on these uh, expense ratios. Now, unfortunately, that's not all our costs. General administrative actually went up from the previous period. So they are still bringing in those salaries and burning through cash there. We've got some corporate expenses, which actually went down and then property transactions went down as well. We see for the most recent quarter, they lost a five hundred million dollars operating the business that compares uh, extremely unfavorably to a 238 million dollar net income or operating income from the previous period so it just shows you they have a long ways to go in a relatively good quarter or a normal quarter is probably a way to put it they made 240 million in a disaster type quarter they're losing a lot of that they're losing almost double that at 495 you see for the nine month end it doesn't look as bad. We may lost 278 million, but it's really impacted by this REIT transaction. Basically, they sold like the 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 land and the property of the Bellagio and I think maybe a couple other ones to real estate investors. And then now MGM essentially pays rent for that property. And so it's kind of a, a way for MGM to pull some cash into the business by selling the land, but also maintaining the property by, by continuing to lease that property back from a, a, a group of investors. And so not a great story yet for MGM. Let's take a look at the balance sheet, see how long they can last. They have a lot of cash here. They've got $4.5 billion. So if they're losing 500 million in a quarter, I would expect that to continue to improve a little bit. They've got enough cash here sitting on the balance sheet for a runway of, of relatively decent proportions. Long-term debt here comes at 11 billion. That actually didn't increase in the most uh, previous period. We see operating lease liabilities. It looks like to me that it's possible that some of this has to do with the transaction, but it could be that they're getting a little bit of a break on their operating leases, like they're not having to necessarily pay the full rent. That is possible, or just that transaction added a lot of operating 
operating lease liabilities, that's probably more than likely there. So from a balance sheet perspective, it's not perfect. It's not as bad as you would uh, maybe think. The other thing that's happening in Vegas is the owner of the Palazzo and the Venetian, Sheldon Adelson, is actually looking to sell his property. So what does that tell you? Somebody that owns property in Vegas is actually looking to get out. That might not be a great sign for the recovery of the Las Vegas Strip. If somebody like Sheldon Anderson, who I know is getting up there in age, maybe he just wants full control over the exit of that asset. I don't know. I just see that as kind of a worrisome thing. If somebody like that is looking to get out, I don't know if I would actively be looking to try to get in with MGM. Although some of the buyers of those properties could be potentially MGM or maybe even Caesars, a competitor of MGM. So it'll be interesting to see. But from a financial perspective, eh, this stock kind of worries me a little bit because they're still losing lots of money. And I actually don't necessarily see this turning around in next year's time because a lot of Vegas relies on on that convention traffic and so many conventions need to be planned six to 12 months in advance. And right now I doubt anybody's really looking to hold a convention in Las Vegas anytime soon in 2021. So a lot of that traffic isn't going to be there. I would guess that MGM's numbers are going to look a lot like this. Now, I know they have exposure to Macau. When I took a look, those numbers were down as well. If that were to rebound, then MGM's numbers would get materially better, but I still anticipate them losing money likely all through 2021. Now, that's only half the story because let's jump over to the stock chart. We got MGM here. I've got us on a weekly view. You see here, this stock has actually been on a steady uptrend. Now, what has happened now recently, just in the last several weeks, is, and in fact, this is uh, about two or three months here. The stock has hit its head on this 50 day moving average. We see this light blue line has it turned negative here and has continued to go negative. And the stock is now hitting its head consistently on this 50-day moving average. But we're coming up, up, up on this uh, upward trend line that I drew in here. So two things can happen. This stock can break above our 50-day moving average and start continue this uptrend. Eventually, this 50-day moving average would turn up and this stock would resume its uptrend. I think the next stop of resistance right at $25 per share, right where I have this line here. You see, we've made some bottoms with this stock here. It kind of broke through and pivoted here. It acted as support here, acted as temporary support here as well. So I this stock is actually right inside of a compressing wedge where it could go either way. So from an earnings perspective, I am not really excited about MGM. From a chart perspective, it paints two different stories. This stock could easily break down below this trend. That would be a bearish sign, in my opinion. We'd probably be coming back down in here, retesting levels. Maybe that 18, 18 to $20 per share would be very easily achievable where it is now. If it breaks above this 50-day moving average, can start turning it positive, can trade above it, then easily we can come in this 25 and above range on this stock. Uh, to me, the risk reward's probably not super high at the current moment. But this is a stock that you definitely can keep an eye on because if it does break down, gets down in the $17, $16, $15 range, I think it obviously has proven that buyers will step in at those ranges. As it comes up here, testing this 50-day moving average, sellers are stepping in and that's currently where we're at right now with MGM. So hopefully I helped you a little bit with MGM. Uh, the casino sector, it's one I certainly have my eye on, but just knowing Vegas as well as I do. It's a place that I, not this year, but it's a place that I would travel to at least twice a year for various conferences. And I would stay quite a long time, a week, sometimes longer in the city. It's a place that I know pretty well. And quite frankly, I know some people that have gone there and they're not impressed with what's happening uh, there. There's lots of crime. There's lots of things that are happening there. The type of crowd that Las Vegas is attracting right now is not the one that will help turn the stock around in my opinion, but that's not to say in the future that they'll be able to turn things around and get things back to normal in Las Vegas. I just think we're a ways away from that point. So hopefully that helps you out with that one. Next question comes in here. When should I use margin when buying stocks? If at all, 
And so I actually don't use margin. I think I've got a little bit of access to it in a, in a Robinhood account. I think you pay five, $10 in Robinhood account and it gets you some access to margin. Here's where I would use margin. If you want to trade options, I think it's almost required unless you have a very, very large account already. And so if you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in account, you might not need a margin account. But if you want to trade options in an account where you have, say, less than $10,000, it would be very hard to trade uh, like stock options without the use of margin. And so margin, in my opinion, is something you use when you want to be an active trader. And especially when you want to trade things like options, that's kind of leveraging your money a little bit in that sense. Well, then you almost need margin in order to get those trades through, unless you have just tons and tons of cash. I would not, and I repeat, I would not use margin if you're a beginning trader, if this is your first year, even second year, third year kind of of buying and selling stocks, I would stay away from it, you know, avoid the temptation that it might provide that, you know, maybe you get more access to more money. Sometimes more money is not the answer to your problems or not the solution to making you a great investor. I would actually look to learn and start things slow. And then as you got more sophisticated and more intelligent about your buying and selling, then you start using margin. So for example, let's use a golf analogy. So hopefully some of you guys, uh, you know, play golf. And, and so, you know, a beginning golfer should not go play from the back tees where Tiger Woods plays from. He shouldn't have the $10,000 set of clubs and be playing with $4 Pro V1 golf balls and be trying to hit all these really complicated shots like cut shots or low shots or high shots. If you're just beginning in golf or maybe even your second, third, fourth year in golf, you should play from the forward tees. It doesn't necessarily matter what set of clubs you have. You could use a $20 set that you buy on the internet or borrow from a friend, you don't necessarily need to use the most expensive golf balls and you probably definitely should not be trying to hit complicated shots like draws and fades and high and low shots. You're just not at that skill level yet. But once you learn how to hit the golf ball, once you practice enough, once you've hit enough shot and proven yourself over a long period of time, that's when you start moving back to the farther tees, you start getting better equipment. And that's how I would look at margin if I was an investor in the stock market. I would not use it until you felt like you knew exactly what you were doing. Not to say that people that use margin don't make mistakes and don't make bad trades. That's not at all the case, but typically the professional traders or the ones with lots of experience know how to limit those mistakes, especially inside a margin account where things can get away from you very quickly. If you don't know how to set stop losses, trailing stops, if you don't know how to properly get in and out of trades, if you don't know how to properly get in and out of option trades, a margin account is a great way to ruin your investing account and quite frankly, ruin your confidence. Because if you blow up an account because you don't know how to actively manage your margin account, well, that is going to really discourage you and probably take you out of the market. So I'd much rather you take it slow, go through the learning process, just like golf, go hit a bunch of buckets of balls, get some lessons, watch some videos of your swing, really practice over a long period of time, and then finally graduate up to where you're using margin. But if you're just an average person that's trying to build up a long-term portfolio for retirement, I wouldn't use margin at all. In my opinion, the, the way to use margin is typically with like an options trade or an options account, because that's where you need access to that. So that's my opinion on margin. Next question comes in from John H. He said, I'd appreciate if you gave your thoughts on Ray Dalio's all weather portfolio. I'm looking to start my second Roth IRA and I'm thinking of deploying this strategy. Thanks and great 
work as always. So appreciate this is a good question. So I had to go look and see what uh, Ray's all weather portfolio was kind of like. And I found this website that was updated just recently. So I got to figure this is pretty updated uh, information here. And it says it's exposed to about 30% on the stock market and 15% on commodities. That's only 45%. So where's the rest going? Looks like a bond portfolio. And so we see here, they actually show you on this website. I'm not affiliated with this at all, but it says lazy portfolio ETF.com. You can get this by searching Ray Dalio's all weather portfolio. It's the top result. And so you can show you here, you can mimic this portfolio, the, the Vanguard total stock market. If you go 30% weight in that, if you go 40% weight in iShares 20 year treasury bond, 15% in a three to seven year treasury bond. So you're about 40, that's 55% just in ETFs. And then you're 7.5% in the gold trust and then 7.5 in a commodity index truck. So this is kind of what it looks like here. Uh, part of this commodities looks like gold. And then part of it is a, a segment of just broader diversified commodities. And then finally fixed income is a mix of weight and maturities. And then stocks is just one single ETF, the Vanguard total stock market, which is a very, very popular ETF. Now, what I would say with this is the, the question didn't necessarily specify this. But let's just say John had $50,000 and he was ready to just start a new Roth account and he was just going to roll all this money over and dump it all at once into this mix. I probably wouldn't. I personally wouldn't do that. Okay. You guys can do whatever you want, but I personally wouldn't do that because especially what we're seeing here is let's take a look. This is 55, over half of this portfolio is in bonds. What do we know about the bond market? Okay. When interest rates go down, the price of bonds go up. When the interest rates go up, the price of bonds go down. Now, if you took a look at any kind of interest rate chart right now, the interest rates are extraordinarily low, which means bond prices are relatively high in that sense. And so how much lower can interest rates go? Uh, they certainly can go a lower and that would drive your bond portfolio values further up. But there is, depending on who you listen to, believe me, I have economists and investors that I listen to that can very coherently argue both sides. Some are going to say that interest rates are going to go down even further further driving bond prices up. Some are screaming from the hills that interest rates can only go up, which would mean the bond price would start to go down down. And so that's how I would think about bonds is because a large portion of this portfolio, 55% is in bonds. I would be carefully trying to tiptoe into that market unless you just have a very, very long time horizon. In that sense, the the fact that yields would go up as your bond price would go down would kind of outweigh the, the difference there because you would collect more bond payment as opposed to principal of your bond actually going up in price. But if it's a shorter term Roth or it's one of those ones that you don't have a very long term time horizon, I certainly would be careful about how I would inch into these fixed income assets. Now, from a total stock market perspective, you also will see both sides out there arguing that stock market is completely overvalued and some saying that it still has got some room to run. That is totally up to you as well, considering 30% of this portfolio is in the stock market. If the stock market takes a big hit at any time over the next year or two, right when you initially invest a large amount of money, well, that would be a problem as well. And you've got about 15% commodities, which is in a huge allocation into this one. So that would be one where I would initially, I, I don't think you're too dangerous into allocating money into that. Although I would watch gold. I'm not going to get into it right now, but the chart for gold, in my opinion, looks like in the short term wants to head a little bit lower before resuming maybe an uptrend. I'm long-term bullish gold, but in the short run, I think it's probably a little bearish for that. So I think it depends on how you want to jump into this type of portfolio. If you have all the money right now and you're trying to just 
dump it all in at once, I would be very, very judicious on how you allocated the money into this type of portfolio. Now, let's say it's the opposite, that you only have, and I say only, it's a lot of money, any amount of money into stock markets a lot, but let's just say you're doing $1,000 a month into this new account. Well, then in that case, I don't, th- I wouldn't have a problem with you just allocating it right from Jump Street, how Mr. Dalio has this set up. So it, it all depends, in my opinion, on how the money gets allocated and when. If you have, let's just say $50,000, I would not necessarily come in here and allocate $50,000 all at once into these. I would try to be more judicious on my timing of that, trying to get things at the best possible price or at the best possible moment. Not necessarily try to time it perfectly, but try to time it a little bit so you just don't have this long wait if bonds just take a big hit because interest rates start going up, you don't have to wait this long period of time for that to turn back in your favor, either by collecting the coupon payments or for interest rates eventually going back down and your bonds going back up in price. This exact same thing happens with the stock market as well. But if you're inching into this, if it's a monthly kind of deposit thing and you're going to be allocating, I got no problem with that. If you want to mimic this, I would say this portfolio is on the safer side. And so if If you're a younger person, if you're in your 20s, I think I'd rather see you be a little bit more aggressive than this, maybe a little less fixed income, maybe a little bit more stocks, commodities I don't have a problem with with as well. I'd probably, uh, you know, pull back a little bit on the fixed income side and be a little bit more aggressive on the stocks. If you're uh, someone of my age, close to 40 or older, this is not a bad mix, especially if you want to be a little bit more conservative with your allocation and you're worried about not necessarily uh, making tons of money, but trying to preserve your investment as best as possible. This is not a bad allocation. And as you can see, earns a 7.21 compound annual return. So hopefully that helped answer your question there, John. Appreciate it. Next question coming in here. Thank you so much for all your video analysis. Appreciate that. Speaking of winners, I'm looking at XOM and CVC in the energy sector, mainly because I think the world is still very much dependent on oil and gas. I would agree with that. But would you be able to do a rundown on their recent earnings report? Would love to hear your analysis. For sure. Now, I couldn't find CVC. Not exactly sure. This could be an, I would bet, an autocorrect kind of messed up your ticker here. So if you leave me a comment down below, I'll try to get to what you meant here. But I know exactly what XOM is. It is actually a stock that I believe that I own. I have a couple shares of Exxon Mobil, in my opinion, the one of the largest uh, gas and oil companies in the world. So let's talk about his question here, because when we take a look, we'll jump into the stock chart as well. Oil has taken an absolute dump. This is a weekly chart of XOM, and this is about as ugly as it gets, especially if you're buying up here in the $70 range. This is a $33 stock right now. That is absolutely as low as some of the lowest price I've ever seen on this stock. So now, unfortunately, oil and gas is a, you know, a function of supply and demand. And as a lot of you are realizing right now at the current moment, oil and gas is not being demanded around the world like it normally is because you have shutdowns and things in general not moving in the economy like they normally would. So you have a glut of oil, which is supply, and in turn, that supply needs to be burned through, in essence, in order for you to see a turnaround in the price. We'll see how the low price of oil is impacting ExxonMobil. So we'll, we'll take a look here. Total revenues and income. We've got the third quarter here, 19 over 20, and then they squeeze in the second quarter right here. And then they've got the first nine months of 1920. So we see for the most current quarter, we made $46 billion. That sounds pretty good. But take a look at our total costs. They actually exceed that at 40 6.5 billion. So we have a negative income from operations of 30, $372 million. Now that's a lot of money, but you see from the second quarter here, we're at $1.6 billion of operating loss. And so it has actually improved. So from an earnings per share perspective, we, we lost 15 cents in the quarter. In the previous quarter, when everything was all good, the world economy was probably as hot as it had ever been. We were at 75 cents per share and we lost 26 
uh, cents per share in the second quarter of this year. And so for the first nine months, we've lost a grand total of 55 cents per share. You see, we've lost $2.2 billion. So this quarter, this last quarter was actually quite an improvement for Exxon. And you see for the last nine months in the previous period, we made an income of $13 billion or $2 per share. So in my opinion, the destruction of this company's business model is still underway. Now they're doing a very, very nice job in this third quarter, kind of mitigating that. And I would actually anticipate going forward, you're probably going to have a lot of quarters that are just like this. We took a look at MGM stock here uh, in a previous uh, question. And to me, the oil companies and MGM, like the casino stocks are all in the same basket. If you have a positive outlook on the industry, you have a long-term perspective on it, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to want to invest in the stock. I just think you need to be very, very careful because things can continue to deteriorate and things can stay bad longer than you actually anticipate. And the supply of oil can keep the profits of this company down for a very long period of time. And so these profits need to come back because they need to pay these dividends. Take a look. We paid 87 cents of dividends in the quarter where we lost 15 cents. Okay. And so that is not a good sign. Even take a look during the nine months last year when 2019 economy was one of the best we've ever seen around the world. Okay. We made $2 and three cents earnings per share, but we paid $2 and 50 cents, 56 cents of dividends. So even in a good economy, this company was paying out more in dividends than it was actually earning per share. And so I would absolutely expect further dividend dividend cuts if they haven't cut it already uh, completely off the table at Exxon. I would in- expect this dividend to not be 87 cents per share when they're losing 15 cents per share uh, from a quarterly earnings basis. Because I don't see the demand for oil. I see the long-term demand for oil. Totally get this listener's question that th- the world is still very much dependent on oil and gas. The first world companies and even developing markets are all dependent on oil and gas. And I don't necessarily see that changing in my lifetime. I probably got another, hopefully, at least 40 years left on this earth. I don't necessarily see this changing a whole lot. I think you can be very, very, very carefully coming into ExxonMobil if it's something that you want to do. If you want to uh, realize the risk, realize the dividend, I would guess when you're taking a look at a stock chart and a a stock that's depressed this badly, shareholders are already factoring in dividend elimination, uh, struggles on the horizon. Just keep in mind that for this stock to turn things around and really bounce back up in price could take a little bit longer than you, than you expect. But from a chart perspective, this look, I'm on a weekly chart right now. This looks like to me could be a double bottom. Have we formed this second bottom yet? I don't know. I would like to see it kind of level off here and start to turn back positive. You would like to see kind of a U shape here at some point. If that's the case, your next stop on this stock is probably seven, eight dollars ahead of where it is today. Obviously, if you get bullish signs on the economy, on the reopening and things like that, which we are not seeing right now, okay? And look, great investors buy in the face of adversity and bad news oftentimes. So we got a lot of bad news in terms of reopening the economy and things like that. Um, can this can this stock survive that? If this stock survives at this $33 level, well, look, then it could bottom out right here at this level. But we are right here at these lows. If it breaks this level and starts trading down, Who knows where this stock will go? Because this is a multi, multi, multi week low. And if you come here on a monthly chart, I can't spread it out much longer. Oh my goodness. The last time we've seen these lows are back in 2002. And so if you believe this level right here, right at $32 on XOM is going to hold. And quite frankly, there's a fair amount of evidence on this chart, at least that it probably will because we bottomed out here in 02 and we're bottoming out here 
now in 2020, I mean, 18 years later, it's incredible. So this is a level where this stock has bottomed out and then look at the run that it had. So not saying that history will repeat itself, but this is a sector where that is potentially possible. I would look for this to reverse a little bit at some point. The financials don't look good and certainly the dividend coverage looks absolutely terrible, but my guess is that investors have already kind of price that in inside some of this price action here. I don't mind you taking a speculative position in XOM, but a position yourself accordingly inside a speculative portfolio certainly would have to likely hold on to this one for a period of time for things to get better. Now, the other play you can do with XOM is, look, things start getting better. Airline travel comes back, get a vaccine, whatever it is. This stock will start to rally. There's a ton of airspace over this stock, okay? Then if this stock starts to rally, the next logical spot is about $67 a share. That's about double where it is today. If this stock gets up to $45 on good news, look, from $45 up to $65 is a huge run in its stock. So I don't mind... Also, for you to really wait until the news gets better, more clarity, maybe they turn an operating profit by cutting enough costs and expenses, enough uh, competition goes by the wayside, then XOM is in a great spot. And yes, this stock could very, very easily rally back up into the $60 range. Two ways to play it. I think, you know, you can either take a very, very speculative position now or monitor this one closely, monitor the macro themes, and then watch Watch as this one starts to trend in this upward direction because we are still in a an extraordinarily defined downtrend right here. I would not necessarily want to come in here and grab a falling knife. Wait for that knife to bounce a little bit and wait until the stock actually shows a bottoming formation and starts to turn positive. These MACDs turns positive RSI. Although, boy, they look, uh, at least on a monthly chart, very, very close to doing that. And quite frankly... We're probably only a few months away from stocks like this, the airlines, the cruise lines, starting to catch a bid and starting to catch the attention of investors. So hopefully I helped answer your question on that one. Moving on to the next question, you often seem quite confident in things returning back to normal after they are quite bad. I probably, yeah, I agree with that. And so is this, this uh, viewer here. I tend to agree considering recent downtrend with Microsoft and generally markets because of the virus and U S election, but you seem to operate purely in stock. Okay. What are your thoughts on other instruments? Do you believe in an idea of instrument diversification? Personally, I had quite success with derivatives, specifically warrants after stocks were down in March. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so uh, this is an interesting question. So it's kind of asking, I do, so let me let me back things up a little bit. I do on this channel especially, I focus primarily on the stock market. What I will tell you guys right now is uh, the vast majority of my uh, quote unquote wealth, I think, is actually tied up in my real, actually real estate and my house, the one that I live in, and then I have some other real estate investments. So I have a fair amount of money invested into those things. I have a, I haven't really talked about it here on the channel, but I have a dollar for dollar rule and this is not a recommendation at all. It's just something that I personally live by since I have seen two a uh, very gigantic financial crashes in my lifetime, the dot com and the 28, 2008, 2009 crisis. I have a dollar for dollar rule. Every dollar that I have in the stock market, I have a dollar in real assets and by real, I mean gold and silver could be jewelry, could be watches, could be gold coins, could be silver coins, those types of things. So for every dollar I have in stocks, I actually have a matching dollar. Now it goes out of balance. Okay. It goes out of balance. Uh, some years I'm probably overweight in the stock markets. You go buy a nice watch or you buy a nice, uh, couple of nice gold coins or things like that. Now you're overweight in these real assets. And so I, I kind of bounce around a little bit, but in general, I try to balance those things out. It's just something that I personally like to do. Also what I tell people is there's only so much fun you can have 
with stock mar- stocks in a portfolio. Okay. It looks really good on a computer screen and maybe on your phone, but other than that, it doesn't do a whole lot. Now, of course, it's a poor forming assets in terms of dividends, in terms of a tax write-off with an IRA that I am kind of generalizing things to a little bit, but you buy a really nice watch. You can enjoy that every single day of the week, every month. You might get compliments on it. It just makes you feel good. And so I, I don't necessarily operate purely in stock, but it is uh, the cornerstone of one of the cornerstones of how I am building wealth. So I kind of gave you an, my idea on other instruments. If you want to play around with derivatives, you want to play around with options or long-term leaps. So when stocks make big down, uh, kind of like Exxon Mobil, which we just talked about, you know, you could buy these leaps way out in the future on uh, Exxon Mobil and say, look, this is a stock in two, three, four years is going to be at a higher price. I wouldn't mind playing around with that. Whatever you are comfortable with, I personally would encourage you to do as much research and educate yourself as much as possible on whatever you decide to get into, whether it's options, whether it's stocks, whether it's ETFs, whether it's bonds, whether it's physical assets like real estate, gold, silver, jewelry, watches, anything of that nature. So that's how I would answer this question, that I love other instruments uh, while I love stocks and a good large portion of my money is tied up in the stock market. I live in a very high tax state and I live in a federal government that does tax uh, capital gains at a very relatively high rate. And there's definitely a push to push that higher. And so you have to be careful allocating a lot of money into the stock market when you're in a position like me, if you're trying to not necessarily avoid paying taxes, just control the tax burden that you might be left with. If you have build a very, very significant portion of your wealth in stocks. So I deposit the vast majority of my investments go into an IRA account, which I am capped at a $6,000 deposit on a yearly basis. And so at least from a tax deductible perspective. So I tend to just stick with stocks in that sense, but I love other investments as well. Moving on. Our next question comes from Trey. I want to invest in in energy and banks, but I'm not sure which companies to go with. I've looked at the top companies in each sector, but I'm still not sure where to put my money. This is a great question. What are your thoughts on these sectors and which companies do you think have the best future? I'm investing for the long term. If that helps, thanks for the awesome and informative video. So great questions, Trey. Let's start with energy. What I just talked about with ExxonMobil, if you want to rewind, if you didn't check the, the summary on ExxonMobil, this is a sector and a company under a lot of pressure. And so with energy, I would also also reference back, we answered a question on today's show where we talked about ETFs. Instead of going in there and trying to pick the winners and losers in the energy sector, I would pick the energy ETF. The energy ETF that most people, or in fact, the largest one, in my opinion, in terms of popularity is the XLE. And so if we scroll down here on the XLE, we see the top 10 holdings are Chevron, ExxonMobil. Take a look. Chevron and ExxonMobil make up 45% of the XLE's top 10 holdings. So here's two things you can take away from that. Number one, if you want to build a portfolio of energy stocks, we'll take a look at what the big money managers, probably some of the smartest people in oil and gas are telling you, here is where you should allocate your money. Chevron and Exxon are a huge portion of this portfolio. They're banking on these guys being around a long time. So There's that information. The other thing you can just say is instead of trying to come in here and pick winners, well, I can get 45%, 46% exposure to the top two, and I can get a little bit exposure to all these other little guys. And I can come in here with a little bit less, a little bit more margin of safety than trying to come in here and pick winners and losers. And so when you're not sure about which companies to go with, trust me, I'm in that situation all the time. 
I would go with an ETF or at least start there. And then if, as you invest in XLE, maybe you, maybe you get more market research, you do more, more investigation and you decide either Chevron or Exxon, or maybe one of these smaller ones like Conical Phillips or Phillips 66, or one of these other companies will outperform. And then you add a little bit of that to your portfolio as well. But when you're not sure which companies to go with, I would focus primarily on getting an uh, ETF. And so the XLE with, um, with energy and in the financial sector, I would go with the XLF. It also is the, ex- I mean, it's like the exact same company runs both of these. And so you get a very low expense ratio, 0.13 on this one. You are going to get a dividend on this one as well. And then finally, let's take a look at where they have the most of their money. Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, Bank of America, BlackRock. Okay, personally, if I were to recommend, I know a little bit more about the bank sector than I do energy. If I were to recommend banks, I personally would recommend them, not necessarily in this order, but I would recommend this group of four right here, BlackRock, Bank of America, JP Morgan, and Berkshire Hathaway. I think if you want to mix in a little bit more, you've got Morgan Stanley, you've got Goldman Sachs down here. If you want to do uh, even more than that, you've got Visa, not necessarily typically a bank stock, but you've got American Express in here as well. The credit card companies, not a bad thing as well, but I would focus on these top four. Okay. Full disclosure, I own all of these top four except for BlackRock, I believe. And so, and BlackRock's one I do want to get into. So I like these banks up here at the top, but if you, again, you could play this exactly like the energy sector, instead of trying to pick winners and loser, you can come in here and get exposure inside the XLF. I think this is one of the best ETFs if you want bank exposure, because they just have a really, really nice allocation here. In my opinion, you get, while you're, you're overweight Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan, you are getting exposures to the other banks. You're collecting a dividend and they're doing all all the work for you in terms of allocation and, and buying and selling. And so that's how I would play this. In my opinion, I have, I think both of these sectors, especially the banking sector, I am very bullish on, but you need to be very patient. Okay. Again, you have a long-term outlook, which is exactly what you need with the energy and bank sector. I don't necessarily think they're going to turn things around right away. I don't think they're going to, you're going to see a V-shaped formation like you might see in an Apple stock or a Tesla stock or any of these other high flying stocks. But over the long term, these stocks should bounce back and they should back, bounce back very nicely. Next question coming in from Dan H saying, anyway, you can explain how to use TradeStation and give a quick tutorial on how to use it every day to benefit your everyday trading. Good question. So one of the reasons why I use TradeStation is because I am on a Macintosh device. And quite frankly, a lot of the great desktop versions of these, in fact, trade stations is way better. If you have a Microsoft or a uh, Windows based device, I personally just don't have one at the current time. I I do everything on Apple devices. That's not an an endorsement. I might get a, a Microsoft or a Windows based device here in the future. I would encourage you if you have a Windows based device, well, trade station and uh, street smart from Schwab and think or swim. There's just a lot of platforms out there, which I think that are as good as anything else out there. I just personally use trade station simply because I'm on a Macintosh device and I'm actually on the website here. This is actually a web app through a browser, which is not an, not a lot of competition or not a lot of offerings out here offer this. So what it allows me to do here is I can come in here with these trend lines and what I like to do if you've watched the channel is draw these vertical and horizontal kind of trend lines in. It also gives you a weekly and daily view. So if you want to look at stocks on a daily view, also you can tick it down to if you want to look at it like a 60 minute view. You can also come in here and add different types of, uh, you know, different kinds of analysis. So they've got all kinds of stuff in here, all kinds of merging, uh, moving averages you can have, RSI, which is something I can use, VWAP, there's 
those guys that use that stuff. Volume average. There's just everything you can add in here. And then when you come in here, you can change the colors on it. You can do different things here to help give yourself uh, the kind of view that you're looking for. You can also look for different kind of moving averages. So I've got a 50 day moving average, but if you wanted to do like say a 200 day moving average on here, you can do that. And then it would eventually it's thinking about it right now, but it would paint the 200 day moving average instead of a 50 day moving average. I'm on a 60 minute time frame. I don't know how great a 200 day moving average is on that, but that's the types of things that personally, this is how I use trade station is primarily to get this charting function inside a web or a browser based experience without having to run what you normally have to do is run some kind of like emulator on your Mac to run Windows to be able to run something like the desktop version of TradeStation or a Street Smart Edge or something like that, you have to usually run some other type of software for whatever reason those companies have not made Macintosh based systems. Now, what I also use it for, and I think this is the, probably the, one of the coolest things on TradeStation is on my quote page here, I've got a bunch of symbols that I like to track. And here's their next earnings report. And you see here in one day, plug power is coming up and, you know, you can come up here to Apple that's coming up on January 26th. So 79 days away, this will help you with your trading. So for example, like say you wanted to trade Disney right now. Well, you'd see here, their earnings report is four days away. So you'd want to plan your, quite frankly, you want to plan your trade around that. Okay. Because if Disney announces really good earnings or really bad earnings, it's really going to impact the stock. Whereas coming down here to maybe like uh, Intel, they just reported earnings. So they've got 74 days until they announce their next earnings report. So you can get in there and maybe be more freewheeling with your trades because you know that earnings is not going to disrupt that. And so this is what I primarily, I love it for this sense is because I can type in a ticker symbol and I can get a clear answer on when their next earnings report is. And this is updated, uh, you know, relatively well. And it's something that allows me to follow when the companies that I'm following announce earnings. It helps me not only from an investor standpoint, but on the channel as well. I know when, when I get a specific question on a stock, I can let people know, well, look, in, in 20 days or 18 days or 50 days, we'll have an earnings report and that's when to expect an answer on that. So that's how I personally use TradeStation. It is just one portion of, I use it mainly for the, again, the chart functionality in a browser. Okay. If you are on a windows device, you can look at Schwab. You can look at street smart. You can look at trading view. You can look at trade station. There's a number. I would actually encourage you to just experiment, figure out which one you like best, especially on a windows based device. Or if you have a windows emulator on your Macintosh that you want to run, you can certainly do that as well. I have way more money in E-Trade and Schwab accounts and uh, TD Ameritrade accounts. Accounts, but I just happen to use TradeStation for this channel and for the chart function because I think it looks the cleanest in my opinion and it's one that I am comfortable with. But I would encourage you to get out there and experiment and figure out which one you like the most. But in terms of the functionality, I really only use these trend lines. There's fib retracement if you want to come in here and, and kind of do what you know what people do. I, I'm not a big Fibonacci guy, but there, there this does make sense when I I see people walk through it. There's just a lot of things that, that you can do in all of this. And what I also like is it saves all my trend lines. So when I come back to my Amazon chart and I pull up my Amazon chart, all my trend lines are saved. Same with my Apple, all the stocks where I've drawn trend lines in, it saves it for me. And that's probably another aspect of TradeStation and all these trading plat platforms with chart features is what I love is it just saves all my my work so I can quickly jump in here, especially with something like Apple. I can quickly jump in here, see where the price is, see where I've had levels marked off. And so if it pulls down into zones that I like, well, then obviously I'm looking to buy. And if it's going up into zones where, I, you know, it might be a overhead resistance. I'm definitely not looking to add or buy in those spaces. So that's what I really like about TradeStation. 
Last questions come from Derek and Lindsay Sparks. Money matters. Sincere question. What is the current hype on Bitcoin? Specifically, why choose that over mutual fund ETF and individual stocks? Why Bitcoin or just cryptocurrency? Is it a trend or a long-term buy? It's an interesting question. Um, so Bitcoin, in my opinion, has probably been hype or quote unquote hype for a, a long period of time. So in my my opinion, it's probably past the hype stage. And it and in my opinion, Bitcoin is a real legitimate asset class. Now, obviously, when you put a dollar in Bitcoin, that dollar could have gone into a mutual fund, could have gone into an ETF or an individual stock. So certainly when you invest in Bitcoin, you are choosing that over the other stocks or other options that you have out there. But what I would say about Bitcoin is to me, it's just another asset class out there. So I, yes, I have individual stocks. Yes, I have some ETFs. I do have a few mutual funds that I still have as well. Bitcoin is just another piece of the puzzle and how much you allocate into it or how much you want to allocate into it is totally up to you. But I totally understand people that might be skeptical of Bitcoin or not want to touch it at all. It certainly is a, an extraordinarily volatile asset class. You can see that it can go up very quickly, but it also can go down very quickly as well. That's why my allocation to Bitcoin is a very small amount of money. At least to me, I think I have a few thousand dollars to where if Bitcoin for whatever reason were to go to zero or very close to zero, my kids and my family are still going to eat. Whereas if the stock market or ETFs went, my ETFs or the stocks went to zero, uh, my kids are still going to eat, but my stomach is probably going to be in knots for at least a few weeks Why I stomach those types of losses. So that should kind of give you an idea on where I feel Bitcoin is in the pecking order in terms of my allocation. So uh, certainly I, I like Bitcoin. Bitcoin, when we're talking about Bitcoin, sometimes Bitcoin and cryptocurrency are, are synonymous with each other, but they are different. And so when I say Bitcoin, I mean BTC Bitcoin specifically. There are lots of other cryptocurrency out there like Ethereum and Dogecoin and all these other ones, Ripple. And I, in my opinion, if you want to dip into those, you're going to have to do a lot more research and probably have a lot more longer term, you know, perspective on those types of cryptocurrencies. So cryptocurrency is something that I think it's still in its infancy stage. I think the blockchain technology behind it is certainly something that is being used and will be used more. Will Bitcoin benefit because of that? I would say probably yes. And so that's probably the most bullish thing I think about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general is the, actually the blockchain technology behind it. The other thing to keep in mind is there is a finite amount of Bitcoin. And at some point, I think it's in the white paper that's released about Bitcoin, that date comes at a at a specific point and when bitcoin runs out or there's really no, very little bitcoin left to be released into circulation well then it becomes a you know a finite amount unlike you know, maybe an ETF, shares of an ETF or stock, or even like gold and silver, where there's certainly a finite amount of it on earth. We just don't necessarily know how much that is. Whereas Bitcoin has a very set and specific amount of Bitcoin that will be released. And also plenty of Bitcoin has been lost or, you know, or misplaced in the digital ecosphere. And so even less of it exists than the specific number that is placed on Bitcoin. In my opinion, it is both a trend and a long-term buy. I don't know, necessarily know if that makes sense, but Bitcoin can trend very strongly in either direction. We've seen it's gone up super high up into the 20,000s and it's gone, you know, maybe a year later down to, to three or 4,000. So it can trend very, very quickly in one way or another. But I also think it is a long-term buy, not necessarily at elevated levels. But I think it can easily be a part, just a small portion of your portfolio, your overall investing theme. In my opinion, Bitcoin can certainly fit in there. But 
before I got a full allocation of Bitcoin, I'd probably have a full allocation of ETFs, individual stocks, gold and silvers, bonds. It'd probably be the fourth or fifth thing that I allocated money to, but it's certainly something that I would get into at some point. So guys, that about wraps it up for the Q&A. Again, if you have a question here on the channel, leave me a question down below. I'd love to get to it as quickly as I can on next Sunday's question and answer video. Hit that like button and that subscribe button if you like what we're doing here on the channel. We'll be back all this week with more investor videos. Thanks for tuning in. Good luck with your investments.